Hello everyone. Hey Lori, hey! <laughs> hey Lori, I'm just about to call in our guest. Hang on for one sec here. Let's see here, Joshua Gershik. Okay. All righty, let's see here. Hey! hey. <laughs> we did it. We did it. I know it. it. I practiced. Sunday. I practiced many times. Okay, you know what? That, you, it was just easy. It was effortless. <laughs> you know, that is. I would have never a... known. <laughs> oh, thank you. I shouldn't have told. I should have just appeared like an expert. Okay, exactly, exactly. Well, happy Sunday. How are you? Thank you. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween, which, you know, right. what's thing? I forgot today is Halloween, which I, I am not, I've never been particularly into, into, for many years, I was, I never had a costume. And, you know, every year at the office, there'd be those costume parties. And I was a party pooper. And I just told everybody every year, I'm, I'm Sidney Poitier's son. That's what I said <laughs> every year. That was my a low stress, low stress. It costume. was a low stress <laughs> costume, you know, and a fantasy. So yeah. it, it all worked. It all worked. I see people are starting to come in. Oh, there's Marta. 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 She's, a god She's a goddess. Yes, she is. Yes, she is. Well, before I want to welcome everyone to Frederick Johnson in conversation, uh, my guest, I would like to introduce my illustrious guest, Joshua Irving Gershik, and tell you a little bit about Joshua before we get into this conversation. Joshua Ir Irving Gershik's work illuminates the lives of LGBTQ Americans who've been hidden from history. His plays include Dear One, Love and Longing in Mid-Century Queer America, Coming Attractions in Blue Bonnet Court, which is a winner of the GLAAD Award for Outstanding Los Angeles Theater. He is the writer-director of the film Door Prize, which is the winner of the Alfred C. Kinsey Award, honoring film that further under the understanding of gender or sexuality. And he is the author of two acclaimed oral histories, Gay Old Girls, which was the winner of the Forward Book of the Year Award for LGBT Nonfiction and American Library Association Book of the Year nominee and a Lambda Literary Award finalist, and also subsequent novel Secret Service Untold Stories of Lesbians in the Military, which is the winner of the Forward Book of the Year Award for LGBT Nonfiction, a former newspaper reporter and editor. He earned an MFA from the USC School of Dramatic Arts and an MPW from the USC Dornsife College. Gershik loves to teach and is a member of both the Dramatist Guild and Authors Guild. Everyone, please welcome Joshua Irving Gershik. I'm so <laughs> glad you're here today. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, yes. Okay, so we have a, a lot to cover even yeah. before we, we get into the latest uh, project, uh, Dear One, which, is, which I can't wait till we discuss that. But I just wanted to... My first question is, when did you know you were a writer? That is all I can ever remember wanting to be. Okay. Always. I was always holed up with a book. I read the dictionary. It was a complete nerd. I read the dictionary <laughs> before going to bed. You know? Really? Yeah, it was just ridiculous. And I was a listener. Okay. I was a listener. Um, my mother used to tell me that I didn't start talking when all the other kids, you know, began talking. And she said, but when I did begin talking, I spoke in complete sentences. So I was mm -hmm. listening, right. you know, <laughs> I was listening. It wasn't that you my... couldn't speak. You just were listening. Yeah, I was just listening. And I spent my childhood listening because my parents were older. And that's what you do with older parents. You, mm -hmm. you sit around with their friends and you listen to their stories. It was a good beginning for a baby writer. Do, do you remember the first thing you wrote? Yes, it was, you know, astonishingly bad poetry. In the fourth grade, it began, I have a little poodle, he's skinny as a noodle. You know, which is why, which is why I'm not the poet laureate of the United States. <laughs> That's look, that is still cute for fourth grade. Yeah, well. Okay. You know. Do, what was it like for you the first time your work was published? 
Oh, I have to think about that. I was on the high school newspaper, but I don't remember anything but writing a scathing review of a of the of a high school production and having the drama teacher come in and and excoriate me okay. in front of all the other baby writers and tell me I was a hack and how dare I, you know. Okay. I don't remember what I said, but it was obviously unpleasant. You know? <laughs> and look, when you upset a drama teacher, yeah. you know it's, it's not good. You know, how <laughs> dare you? And then I remember I worked for a feminist newspaper. I think I was about 20 years old, just a, a stringer, which is, a, you know, a contributor. Okay. Uh, it was called Plexus. And I remember I did a profile of a woman who was the first out queer gerontologist mm. at San Francisco State. And I think I mentioned to you before about her. She became a friend of mine, and she really encouraged me to begin to sit down with older LGBTQ people and listen to their stories and collect their stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, Which you know, there's, yeah, it's just, a, it was an indescribable, um, indescribably joyous feeling to see mm -hmm. your name in print. And, yes. but, but beyond that, to see how your work could be helpful in uplifting others and drawing attention to things that needed to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Josh, you've written across multiple mediums because you've written film, you've written, you know, you've written nonfiction books, you've written plays. Um, is there a different methodology for you in terms of writing as you approach these different mediums? Well, they're all terribly scary. Okay. You know, I think. And I, I really got a little later start as a writer. I was mostly dabbling and working in journalism in my 20s. And it was only at the end of my 20s that I began to overcome that fear of the blank screen or when I was in college, the blank page, because we still were working on typewriters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, so I think it's all kind of scary, but every, every kind of writing has a structure. Mm -hmm. For a play, it's a two-act structure. For a film, it's a three-act structure. For a newspaper story, it's the inverted pyramid, the most important stuff at the top, dwindling down to the least important stuff because editors cut from the bottom up, mm -hmm. you know? Or a, a college essay, you know, again, uh, introduction, body, conclusion. So once you know the structure, then that's kind of a key to enter. Yes, yes. I, yeah. I want to go back to what you had just started to talk about, um, the whole idea of oral histories. Yeah. Um, I know in, in your, your first, first book, Gay Old Girls, this was like interviews that were a collection of life stories and yeah. lesbians recounting their own stories from especially like an earlier time in the 20th yeah. century. Your book after that Secret Service was interviews with you know uh, people that were that were serving in all different capacities, right? Um, telling their stories. So I wanted to ask you, like, one, what is the significance for you of the whole like the oral histories and telling that type of story? And then two, as a newspaper reporter, did that really inform that type of writing for you? Yes, I think that's a really wonderful question, Frederick. Yes, because a newspaper reporter is doing a lot of listening. Mm -hmm. You have to ask the right questions. You have to do the research to know what questions to ask. And then also know when people are off base, out and out lying, or just misremembering. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and so that's a, I think newspaper reporting was a great grounding mm -hmm. for oral history. I, and I really s began oral history because I wanted understanding that I was a, a little gay kid. I really began to want to hear stories of my parents' era from a gay perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, and, and I knew gay people, my, my parents had a number of gay friends. My father owned a restaurant. He had gay employees. 
they didn't, you know, wear, wear t-shirts that said it's good to be gay, but you just knew. Right. And they were just accepted. But I didn't really hear their stories. What was it like to come out in Chicago in the 1930s? What was it like working in a factory during the war years as a gay person? What was it like during the McCarthy era? What was it like during the Depression? So I, I really purposely went after those stories to hear, you mm -hmm. know, what was that perspective like? What, how did that differ from the stories that my parents told? Mm -hmm. What was it like to be LGBTQ when, you know, we were sick or criminal? You, mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. you could end up in jail for the slightest indiscretion in quotes. Yes. You know, we had no, no rights, no, no rights at all. Yes. What was that like? Yes, yes. And you know, I, I want to, this for me is I, it's a perfect lead in to start talking about Dear One because Dear One is, it's not the oral histories in the sense of you doing interviews, but it's it's based on the letters. But it's from that, it's, it's kind of harkening back to looking at a particular time period, you know, inner time periods in history and what those experiences were. Before we get into it, I want to make sure I say this, and I'm going to make sure I say this a couple of times because I want people to clearly know how they can see Dear One. So I just want to tell people, Dear One, will be premiering next Friday, November 5th. It will play Friday, November 5th and, and Saturday, November 6th at 8 p.m. Eastern. Now this is a stage live production at a venue in New York City, but it's going to be streamed to a virtual audience. So you do not have to be in New York City to see it. Um, this is going to be streamed. It will be live and it will be staged. So you will be watching the live stage production so you can get tickets. It's, oh, it's produced by 4th U Artivist. And you can get tickets at fourthuartivist.com. Everything I just said, I'm going to post after this interview. So you don't have to memorize all of that. I just want to make sure people understand this is next weekend. So you want to make sure you get the tickets. So as we talk about Dear One, um, I'll mention this again too at the end. And of course, the information will be in the post. But tell us about Dear One. I love the title, Love and Longing in Mid-Century Queer America. So tell us about yeah. this. Play. Yeah. Well, this play, as you said, is based on letters written by readers of One Magazine. Now, many people don't know that One Magazine, published here in Los Angeles, where Frederick and I are coming from, um, was the first widely available, openly published, what we would say in the day, gay and lesbian, we would say LGBTQ plus or queer publication ever in the United States. It was hatched, the idea of it was hatched in 1952. Um, and the first magazine went on the newsstands in January of 1953. Mm. And the magazine was available in major cities in only a few places, but the vast majority of the magazines went out in plain brown wrappers to small towns you know, farming villages, communities all across the United States, and in fact, all across the world. Mm. And um, people wrote back to one magazine, largely people who were without community, really longing for connection. And the, the magazine became their connection to a larger queer community. And so naturally people wrote um, of love and longing of their deepest desires, of their fears, of the troubles that had beset them, you know, of their hope for a new world in which they could be accepted. Some of the letters are quite long and rambling, as you can imagine. Oh my God, you discovered there's a, what? There's a queer community and I can reach out to them. And so people wrote long, long letters, some typewritten, some in a beautiful, some in a beautiful mid-century script. You know, you might remember how mm -hmm. your mom or your aunties wrote in this beautiful, loopy script. Some people, you know, uh, scratch their letters out in, in, uh, in pencil. I mean, some were written on gorgeous stationery. It was, a, it was amazing. And the letters themselves the what I present in the show 
are monologues based on the letters that, that live at the one National Gay and Lesbian Archives at the USC libraries. Now, I wanted to mention that because they're this, so they're, they are archived. Yes. Year one, the letters. How did you come to this project? Like, how did you even find out? Did you know about Dear One? Were you thinking of doing something based on this magazine? Had you been familiar with it? How did you come to yeah. this project? Well, like many things, someone asked me for help. You know, mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine was on the board of the One National Gay and Lesbian Archives, and they were having their 60th anniversary gala. And they realized at the last minute, we don't have any entertainment. Right. And so she reached out to me and said, can you help us? A, a graduate researcher had unearthed a, an enormous trove of letters, some of which he used for a, um, I think his PhD project. And he focused on McCarthy very specifically. So they said, well, we have this box of letters and you can just hear some, hear 25 or so letters from the box. Could you stitch together some kind of a performance? So I very, I think we had 30 days <laughs> and I called on five of my fav, favorite actor friends. Some of them might be here online, Paul Jasek and Dalila Ali Raja and Doug Spearman, um, Hunter Hughes. And we did a show based on these letters. And it was really kind of a quick and dirty, but people were spellbound mm. by the letters. And they elicited so many different emotions. People were laughing and crying. And, and I thought, wow, mm -hmm. I think um, I need to go back into the archive and look to see what's there. Because again, this researcher had been looking at the McCarthy era and that's just one little piece but also his letters were largely from a, uh, a gay, white, cis male perspective. And I thought there have to be other letters in this collection. And he had said, no, not really. And I thought, no, I'm gonna go back in. So from 2012 to really just before the pandemic, I kept diving into the archive and yeah. some of it, uh, it's largely really unmined and unorganized, you know? And so I just went back in and I was looking very specifically. The funny thing is for the last, the last um, couple of years from on and off, I had graduate researchers, babies, you know, from UCLA mm -hmm. and U USC. And I would say, okay, this is what we're looking for. And I want, uh, queer people of color and let's look at this and let's find more women's letters and bi letters and trans letters, even though the writers at the time might not have used these specific terms to describe themselves, look for these themes. And we were quite successful in, in finding a number of letters. The funny thing is that with the handwritten letters, the, these kids, 18, 19, 20, they could, didn't know how to read them. <laughs> because one it day, wasn't typed on a no, computer. They, right? Yeah. And they, one day I had sent them on a mission to look for a very specific kind of letter and they came back with bupkis, you mm. know, zip. And I thought, this can, you just went through five boxes. Are you kidding me? And I went back and I fished out all these letters and I came mm. back and I said, you know, what about this? And they were like, well, we can't, we can't read that. Okay. Like it's hieroglyphics, you know? Right, because they're not, you know, it's so interesting. It's a whole generation of people that, are, that have perhaps never really written a letter. So right. they've never read, you know, they haven't read anything handwritten and especially in, in some sort of penmanship that, right. that no one has been writing in probably for some time. I was going to, I could only imagine what a huge undertaking this was. And I, so when you tell me 2012 to 2015, because I know in your play, the letters that you selected are from 1953 to 1965. Um, but I think Dear One, what did they, I think they went beyond 1965 or was that the entirety of, of the publication, those 12 years? Those were, uh, those were the meatiest years. 
Okay. After that, there were uh, reprints and uh, kind of a more of a haphazard uh, publishing schedule. So I okay. looked at that period as really where the meat was. And how many letters, like when you got into this archive, I mean, like approximately, like how many letters are we talking that's in this archive? You know, I, I wish I had researched that question. Just the letters that I alone scanned. It has to be thousands of letters. Wow. wow. Thousands. And yeah. I really saw only a portion of them. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are others there waiting to be mined. Yes. Um, but an extraordinary number of letters. And, and um, the magazine, you know, the, the magazine is archived at, at the USC libraries and anyone can go and read those issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're uh, fully available. And many letters each month were printed. A number of them were not terribly meaty. Like, hi, I love your magazine. Here's $10 for two years subscription. So I was really looking for, for letters that had a real story mm -hmm. in them uh, where I could really pull out a middle, a beginning, middle, and end there, where, mm -hmm. that, where there was a satisfying arc. Right. I was going to ask you, how did you decide, like, on what letters to choose? So I know it was like looking for things that had a story there in the letter. Yeah. Um, how do you take letters? I mean, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about structure early, but just the whole idea of translating thousands of letters that you've now distilled down to, in the case of this production, the 40 that you, that you chose, but how do you translate that to the framework of a play? Like, I, it, I can only imagine this was, I mean, this is a huge undertaking with the research alone. It's a, it was a lot. Well, we, I tried really to have a, a chronological arc. We end the last letter in this iteration of the play is written by a chap named Ian Ashton, writing from Canada. And he has just discovered this book, the, um, I think it's The Homosexual Revolution. I might be having a brownout right now by R.E.L. Masters. And he's astonished in this book to read that there's such a thing as a gay community. And the writer who wrote on sex and gender masters, Robert E.L. Masters, uh, is a little, uh, is a little um, exploitative, I'd say a little, a little confidential magazine-ish, but he, the writer projects this future for gay America where people can be themselves and be free. And the, the writer of this letter is on board. He mm -hmm. wants to sign up. He's ready for the revolution mm -hmm. and he wants to be a part of it. And so we end on that a rallying note. Yes. Yes. You know, whereas in the beginning, we start with a letter from a gent who does not sign his name. And he, it, the letter is called My Credo, and he's setting out what he believes about queer America. You know, that yes. we're good and loyal and just and, and we're fine people. And, and this, of course, flies in the face of the prevailing notions at the time about yes. LGBTQ people as sick and criminal. Um, and then, um, so there is a kind of an arc. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, within the letters themselves, they all have an arc. I really wanted to make sure they had a beginning, middle, and an end. So... Yes, it, but it was, it's huge. And especially, I, I feel it's a sacred duty. Mm -hmm. I'm taking someone's letter. It's maybe the last bit of them. I'm taking it, it's a precious thing, a sacred thing. And so I'm very careful. Honest to God, I pray before I touch any of these letters. Mm -hmm. Because I want to preserve the voice the syntax. I want to preserve all of it, the humanity of that letter. And also I want to shape it into 
a satisfying monologue. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't do it lightly. Yes. Yes. Now, in 2020, the Diversionary Theater in San Diego produced Dear One as the premiere of their AmeriQueer audio play series. And, I, and, I, and that's when I first heard it. I heard it as the audio play as part of that production through that theater in San Diego. But had Dear One been staged previously or did it start off as an audio play? No, it, had, it has had six or seven readings. We did one at the LA Times uh, Festival of Books and at the Allowed series in the downtown LA Public mm -hmm. Library. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Invited at the time by Louise Steinman. A, mm, a great I have been to L Allowed Book Series functions. It's a wonderful space. Yeah, it, I mean, it's just beautiful. It has yeah. all the bells and whistles. Yeah. But it's never really before Matt Morrow reached out to me, the um, artistic director at Diversionary Theater. It had never been fully performed, you know? Yes. And because we were in COVID, we couldn't stage it. And so he really, he, it was his idea, like what? Hey kids, let's do a radio play. Yeah. And so that was enormous fun. And it felt right, also given the time period of the magazine, there was, it just added, I felt when I heard it and hearing the typewriter clicking in the background, you know, it really yeah. kind of added to the nostalgia. You had, with that production, also through the participation of the legendary George Takai of Star Trek fame, how did he get involved? That is a really good question. Let me think back to that. In 2020, um, we were doing another benefit for the one archive. And I think one of the board members said, uh, I know George Takei, do you think he'd want to do this? Or we said, who knows George Takei? It was something like that. And you know, it's always six, fewer than six degrees of separation. I found in LA, if you want to know someone, you just start asking, hey, yeah. do you know Frederick Johnson? No. Do you know Frederick Johnson? Oh. And within six people, I'm going to find you. Yes. So one thing led to another. And he said, God bless this man. He said, absolutely. Mm. And I, it, the rehearsal with him was really interesting. We did everything on Zoom. And a part of the rehearsal I like to do is real table talk. We talk about the era. We go line by line. And... For him, this was not academic. He lived it. Yeah. And so he was able to provide such a lens. And that's a letter I don't have. And I'm really interested in finding is a Japanese American letter. Mm, mm -hmm. um, um, I haven't found that it yet. we know, like that we know of. Yes. Yeah. And, like, right. Yeah. And I asked him, Did you read this magazine? And he said, Well, I knew of it, uh, and if I read it or any physique magazines, he said, I wouldn't subscribe. I would go to the newsstand, and you may know this newsstand. It doesn't exist anymore. It's right off of Hollywood Boulevard, and it was a long-ass newsstand, the international newsstand. Yep, I know the exact one. It was on, like, Co Hollywood and Coanger, yes. Hollywood and Ivar. It was on one of those side yes. streets right at the corner extending south of Hollywood Boulevard. It was a huge, huge, yes. I remember. Yeah, you know the place. And yes. he said he would go there with his Ray-Bans on <laughs> and like, and he would have a gay magazine underneath and like Life magazine on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> So no, that's... I remember those physique magazines. I mean, that whole right. thing lasted for a little while. Yeah. I remember they would just kind of have them around in certain places. Like you knew if you went to in West Hollywood, you might just kind of see it along with the LA Weekly sitting somewhere or something like that. Like in yeah. particular, particular places. Um, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Well, in the current production, you have a number of actors um, illuminating these different, these 40 different letters. Um, it, it seemed to me that you guys were very conscious about casting against type in this production. I wanted to ask you why that was important. Well, that's written into the play. The play is written for five actors who disappear into eight different, eight or so different letters a piece. And I really didn't want people to focus on the type of actor. I wanted them to just kind of be chameleon. 
And I, I also wanted people to be able to stretch and grow and to think outside the box. So a, a female presenting person would read a man's letter and a man would read a female presenting person's letter. And we would just mix it up ethnically, gender wise, everything. We yes. would just mix it up. Now with the artivists, the artivists are a phenomenally creative band of creatives. That's, wow, that's a redundant sentence, but never mind. Uh, I know what they, you mean. You know, they're a band of creatives associated with the Unitarian Universalist Church. And they're a band of creatives who, uh, who use the arts for activism. Mm -hmm. And they produce things uh, for the benefit of people doing great social justice work in the world. And why did I tell you that? Ah, so we, we had to do something a little different with this because there are 21 people in this ensemble. 21 of the artists said, me, me, I want to be in it. They, that's so, how it resonated with them. They all wanted a part. Right. And so what I found when I was watching, I had to change this convention because because we see this actor only one time, it, it was a little odd to see a woman reading a man's letter. It just, it, for some reason, because we weren't seeing this actor again and again, it, it wasn't working. So for this production, uh, I'm working with the wonderful, wonderful Nancy Robillard, who is the director. And we decided, no, I think men have to read men's letters and women have to read women's letters of whatever kind of woman that is, cis, trans, whatever. Um, non-binary persons. Uh, we have one non-binary person uh, is reading the editor and they are great. Um, so I'm taking a long time to tell you, we, I had to switch it up. Mm -hmm. for this production because it just yes. quite didn't work now do you have from this production these 40 letters do you have a favorite or favorites oh my god i really love these people yeah one of my favorite letters is miss sherry ainsley mm. and miss sherry ainsley has come from dallas and you may have read her letter she's come from dallas she's a trans woman she doesn't say I'm a trans woman. She says, I have lived as a woman for 14 years. And she has come to be the nanny for these children in this town, Southgate, California. Yes. Now, Southgate, I mean, know you did the research, was a notorious bastion of white supremacy. And, and I, I'm sure she thought, I'm coming to L.A., <laughs> you know as a lot of people still to this day think i'm moving to la and then they might god knows where they really might be right. it may not even be in la county they just kind of see it as this one huge city yeah, yeah. no <laughs> and so and she writes i feel i love this woman she's just she says um that she is behaved above all moral reproach. But even so, she's beginning to feel such a loneliness. Mm -hmm. And she describes, she describes the, the place and the people as strange. Well, yeah, you know. She says, being among, in a strange place among strange people, I'm beginning to know a, a, just an incredible loneliness. Mm -hmm. And she writes to one, hoping that she can come visit their offices. And she says, be around people. You yeah. know, her people. I love that letter. Yeah. I, I love, 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 love that letter. And, and I there's a her. sense across a lot of the letters, which these, these are letters I, I heard. And also I know there were different letters in the audio play. So I've heard those letters. I've read these letters. What I found every single time is that these are letters I'm laughing. These are letters, surprisingly tears come out of nowhere, filling my eyes. Mm. These are letters that like kind of shock me to silence when I really think about, hmm. wow, this is what, like when I really think there's this person that feels completely isolated, alone, disconnected in some town in America that their only lifeline 
is writing this letter. And there are letters where people say, hey, if you know somebody in my area, can you connect us? Or I'm the, you know, people, like you said, really just longing for that connection. And I, I thought you did such a great job and such a cross section of different mm -hmm. types of people all over the country. And then of course in Canada as well mm -hmm. with the letters. I, I have a few, I mean, I loved all of them. So, oh, yeah. but I have a few, I just, I made a couple of notes because oh, I loved um, Charlie from Miami. This was oh, a letter yes. from 1954. And this is, I think he was the flight attendant. Charlie was yeah. the flight attendant and he had, put together some type of protest against yes. the airline. I can't remember if it was a wrongful termination. It was a harassment of some sort. Yes. And I just thought, wow, at this time in 1954, he in the letter said, I think I can get 50 people. And I just, even getting 50 people today on, mm -hmm. my, on my own to try to get mm -hmm. people mobilized. And I just thought mm -hmm. that was huge that in 1954, he was really trying to mobilize people around this issue, you know, against an airline. You know, yeah. as as a flight attendant, I love that letter. I loved, uh, oh God, Brad from DC. This was a letter in 1954. I won't even go into details. Um, I mean, I don't want to give too much away on any of the letters, but this is the one about the senator and the yeah. situation with his son um, and the tragedy around that of just kind of like how people, the lengths that people went to yeah. for for secrecy and, and the shame that they had around, like, I don't want any, it wasn't even his own, homosexuality was like a son's homosexuality he was he was trying to um protect so to speak the identity of um mrs b from santa barbara in 1955 i, I want to ask about this one because this woman wrote a letter that basically said because um there were women's stories told as well in the magazine so this woman from santa barbara writes and, and basically says you guys are liars and don't know what you're talking about because there are no women homosexuals. Yes. And I just thought it was interesting that even in 1955, like, why would she think that there were just no, what, I mean, do you feel like maybe women were passing a lot more women? And I'm asking this kind of going back to gay old girls and secret service. Like, do you think it was easier for women to pass and, to, and that's why maybe somebody like a Mrs. B would actually really think there are no women homosexuals. Yeah. I think that it was much easier if you were a gender conforming female to express affection with another woman. I mean, in Gale Girls, uh, Jane Stevenson told me, you know, she's the person who had a husband and a wife. And she said she would kiss her wife in front of the big bay window in their house, in front of God and all the neighbors. But because the neighbors had it in their mind that, well, this was just her cousin, they never even saw it. Right. You know, plus it was not uncommon in the day for women to hold hands, to cuddle, right. to have sleepovers, all these things. Yes. And no one would bat an eye. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, CM from massachusetts oh, yeah. this was the letter from 1959 what i thought so this was this was the the, the man who was who was basically <laughs> saying i'm gonna marry this woman and live my life uh the end you yeah. know um that's the first letter in the play that the editor an editor character responds to so i wanted yeah. to ask you two things like one why did you, was there a creative decision in making, okay, this is the first letter I want to introduce the character of the editor specifically with this letter. And then two, in your research, were, did all the letters get responded to? Like, were there tons of letters from editors? And then kind of like, how did you decide which letters you knew you wanted to present an editor response to? Yeah. Well, there are editors responded, but sometimes they, it was just a thank you for your letter, like a little one sheet uh, or a, uh, a response to, uh, let's say, a letter requesting a pen pal or an introduction. We don't do that. <laughs> Yours truly, the editor. But what I was looking for were very meaty responses. Now, there were a whole handful of editors, male and female, over the course of one's publishing history. 
And they each had a different way of responding. Mm. Uh, some, in the case of this gent door leg, was really, he was often kind of curt and very unkind. Um, Blanche Baker was a psychiatrist who had a column toward understanding in 1959. It was just a year long column. And her responses uh, were just gorgeous, you know? So they really ran the gamut and they were full and empathic, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So I found that the editors did not respond in depth all mm, the time. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was looking for, thoughtful, um, thoughtful responses. There's a, the a response to Amanda Schauberger, the blind girl from writing for yes. the Midwest. Yeah. Yes, who, who thought, who wanted to move to LA again. And they were just like, honey, it's ex more expensive her than yeah. you think. But they yeah. were, I was happy they referred her to, and you know what? I don't know if it's still there, but I remember for years it is. passing that in. It's kind of near LACC on Vermont. Yes, it's there. still there. So when I read that in the letter, I was like, I know that building. Mm -hmm. So they referred her to that like blind yeah. association. Yeah, yeah. And that was a letter, that, that letter takes an interesting turn because as you point out, it's very dismissive. Like, oh, the rents are high and there are lesbians here, but we don't know where they are. And <laughs> the ones we know are... They're not friendly. Alcoholics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then the editor takes a turn and says, you know, well, I don't mean to be discouraging, you know, which is ridiculous because the whole letter is terribly discouraging. And then he becomes helpful. Yeah. That letter has an interesting arc. I, I wonder when I read it, I kind of wonder too, like if there might have been like a fear, like, oh God, I don't, you know, there's just a vulnerable single person who who's blind. You know, if there was some kind of fear of like, they're making it seem like almost kind of being protective, almost in a way that you wouldn't want your, you're trying to save that younger person from having a bad experience. Don't come to the big bad world of LA. Like you might yeah. be better off where you're at, yeah. so to speak. Well, yes, and the earlier letters, this is before 1958. So up to a certain point, they were very, the editors were very careful and it was an editorial policy. We do not match make. Mm -hmm. We will not give you a pen pal. We will not connect you because they did not want to be seen as um, contributing to uh, a criminality. And of course, to be queer was to be a criminal. Right. So they were very mindful in not extending themselves in that super personal way. Things loosened up a little bit after 1980, uh, pardon me, 1958. The magazine, you know, it, it, just a thing of being homosexual on its face was an obscenity. And the magazine was uh, often uh, taken uh, off of stands, uh, uh, the postmaster would not deliver it. And uh, one sued the postmaster mm -hmm. and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And in 1958, uh, in a very, um, in a very important finding that the Supreme Court decided, no, uh, you can't do that. Just because a magazine is about or for homosexuals does not mean that it's obscene. Right. You know, so things loosened up a little at that point, but the, the, early, uh, the early editors were very, very careful. And you could argue that the editor was responding out of that mindset. Like, let's yeah. not. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I could see that. I mean, it's like they, they would not want to in any way, sh shape or form feel like they were liable or culpable yeah. or, mm -hmm. or, you know, it's protective measure. There was a couple of references I remember in letters about, about <clears throat> rights kind of like, no, you need to know your rights really when it comes to using, using the mail and what have you. Yeah. So there, it kind of alluded to um, that being something of like great significance with the, you know, the postmaster yeah. and the lawsuit. Um, I, the, the last letter I want to mention is yeah. um, Anne Bannon from right. Sierra Madre, 1960. Now this kind of sent me, I kind of went into like a YouTube rabbit hole or an online rabbit hole on this one because I was so, I love pulp novels. Oh yes. And I have a friend, 
I have a friend who's uh, a, a lesbian who's been married for a very long time that, you know, lives here in LA. She collects those lesbian pulp novel book covers. And I've known this woman for like 30 plus years. And I've over the years seen, and she frames them, she puts them on walls, she kind of puts them, you know, decorates her house with them. Yeah. And uh, so I was very familiar with these sorts of works that Ann Bannon was writing. Yeah. What I found interesting is that in this letter, she's basically saying, they're not they're not exposing my work might you guys might kind of help expose the work that i've done so i in my i was like whatever happened to ann bannon because this letter was in 1960 i look her up those books are now like classics she's yes. she, she has had a whole renaissance she's teaching courses in college and all sorts of things yeah. and she's like all over the place and i just thought wow here was a woman who um, who was a mar was married, living in Sierra Madre, writing a letter to Dear One in 1960, probably thinking, "Oh, I'll never, no one will ever read my work. They won't put it out." And <clears throat> yeah, what well, she was, Anne Bannon is such an interesting person. And you're right, her novels are collectors' items, and yes. they have been reprinted by Nyad Press, now now defunct, in the 1980s, and by Cleus Press. And, you know, she sold millions and millions of copies. She was hugely successful, but she was writing because the editor had taken out some gay male material from right. her books. And she thought, well, can't someone <laughs> publish this? And she reached out to one magazine. The interesting thing about uh, Ann Bannon, and this is a matter of public record, I'm not telling tales out of school, is that at the time of her success as a pulp novelist, she was married and living this double life at, where she was uh, raising children and married. And uh, she told me in a correspondence, I believe it was, you know, my, my husband was not fond of my work. He liked the income. But, at, and as she writes in the letters, he was really disgusted by the quote degenerates that she associated herself with mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> the um there are several Ann bannon letters in the archive mm. and she's really really reaching out this letter in particular is uh is has a piece of three distinct letters in it it's a kind of a a conflation of three letters in and um she really wanted to go and visit one to get out and to be among really, I think uh, what she was beginning to realize were her people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 So I, I mean, those were for five letters. I mean, they're, they're all great. I, and also too, I want people to freshly experience these letters. So I just want to mention a few, um, yeah. but, but they, they, and, and, I just felt it like everything that I read and what I heard in the audio play, like I could really feel this sense. And I just going back to what you're saying about the, like the listening and the story very similar to my growing up and having older parents and listening to story. I wonder, I always wonder whatever happened to that person, whatever happened to that neighbor, whatever happened to that. And so I just wonder like what happened to the editors of one, what happened to the fact, you know, another thing when I looked into some old issues that fascinated me were the men's designs that were being advertised for oh, yes. attire. Yes, like the harem pajamas and the, <laughs> what was that? It, I'm, I'm not making it up. What was that mag, uh, that catalog that would come to your the house? Like international that, mail? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. That's what it reminded me of. That's yes. what it reminded me of. And, and yeah. I just thought, like, I want to wear some of that stuff now. Like, who was designing that? I tried to find it. Was a strange, <laughs> it was a strange fashion house name. I, I tried to find it. But that was the thing is that this really kind of showed me, you know, I, I felt very connected to these stories, you know? And I felt like this is kind of like a tapestry and it's like a quilt. It's like the story's continuing, you know? Like, mm -hmm. our lives are still continuing. And we're all part of this one big fabric of these of of these tales, you know, of totally. these stories. Um, proceeds for this production are benefiting the Audrey Lord project. And I wanted to ask you, um, what is the significance of, of this benefiting the Audrey Lord project? Well, the 
Audre Lorde Project in New York City uh, supports queer communities of color. And I didn't have anything to do with choosing the beneficiary. The, the artist reached out to me and said, would you be willing to do the play as a benefit for the Audre Lorde Project? And yes, the great Audre Lorde, absolutely. So um, that's really how it happened. This was a, a beneficiary that the artist had in mind. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, yeah. And so I didn't really have anything to do with the, the choosing, but it's they do great work. Yes. And um, I think it's an important, uh, an important beneficiary. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, yeah. and every, I have to say that every dollar anyone donates for a ticket, ticket prices are five to $500 or whatever. I'm sure big or small, they love it all. Yes. Um, every, all of that goes to the Audre Lorde project. Mm. So that's, awesome. that's really important. And I, it's tax deductible. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, as I cannot believe we're already like so close to no. I, I told you it was gonna fly by. No, go ahead. Did you do you have a favorite letter? Because you mentioned a whole string of you them. know, um I I could have talked about so many. I did I loved, 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 I can't remember the writer's name, but I loved the letter from uh the African American typist. Leon Nuttall. Leon Nuttall, who I looked up on the internet to see if I could find whatever happened. I'm telling you, I was so pulled in by these stories mm -hmm. and these characters, and I wanted to know. And, you know, it was that was a letter, you know, that was personal to me as well, because it made me think, of course, not only about my own life, but also, too, like older men that I knew when I was very young, yeah. that I knew came from this time. Um, you know, I remember my parents had... Um, the, well, there was a there was a home that was kind of like a very nice boarding house. You probably passed this place many a time. I think it was on the corner of like Adams and Western. It was called the Elegant Manor, and it was a big mm -hmm. mansion on the corner. It's like either Adams and Wilton, Adams mm -hmm. and Western, Adams and Arlington, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. And it used to be owned by this elderly black woman, the, Miss Moody, Mrs. Moody, and she owned this mansion. And so this is going back to like mid seventies, late seventies. She owned this mansion and she had the rooms. It was like a boarding house. Oh. And so it was a gorgeous place. And it was one of those places you could rent a room. It was spacious rooms. You shared the bathroom, you shared the kitchen. It was in a mansion. And she also rented spaces in the house for like weddings, receptions, church services that might rent out the space or a room on a Sunday if it was a small congregation. And I remember my parents had a friend who rented a room there for a small church, like kind of metaphysical new thought, mm -hmm. new age, 70s, new age church thing she had going on there. It was called the Inner Circle Church of Graduate Christians. Okay, <laughs> that's how. <laughs> the Inner okay. Circle Church of Graduate Christians, but it was like a new thought, new age um, spin on the Christian church. Mm -hmm. and, and, and some of the men that lived there went to that church. And mm -hmm. these were, men that were kind of like renting these rooms, you know, like living alone, you know, having these, you know, these, these jobs and these office jobs in LA and really kind of, you know, more kind of more on the fringe. And they yeah. were in situations where they couldn't live with their families. They didn't have those relationships anymore. They couldn't afford more than the room that they were renting. And yes. so some of those men I remember getting to know, and it just, it reminded me of people that I had known. And I just thought, I was so glad you included that letter. There's such great diversity across all of the letters. I, I, there was also a heartbreaking letter about the young Mexican American man who had had experienced love and then wasn't sure like that was an editor response too, an yes. encouraging letter of like, you know, you deserve love, you're worthy of love, you know, you're, you know, there was, so th those were a couple of my, my, my favorites for personal life reasons. And also people I felt like I actually, I was like, I know these people. Yeah. I've met these people. I know yes. these stories. So I just thought it's really powerful. It's really, really powerful. Josh, what's next? What are, you, what are you working on now? Or what can we look forward to next? Wow. Well, I always have a number of things that I'm trying to touch, you know. I have a, a, a newer play that I've been working on called Queerland. 
And it is a collection of monologues. Again, I love talking to people because people have extraordinary stories. And it is a walk through the 20th and early 20th, 21st century from an LGBTQ perspective. Mm. So um, the characters in it are really amazing. Some of them came from uh, transcripts, interviews that I had left over. In Gay Old Girls, the publisher limited me to nine persons, but I had 25 interviews. Mm. And um, so some of them are uh, finding a home in this play that I hope to um, workshop. Okay. So yeah, awesome. queer land, it's fun. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to that. And, and also since, since we're local, I'm just saying if, if, if there's any way I can help in any way um, with that project, I would love to, you know, I would love it. Offer, offer whatever type of assistance you might need in any way, shape or form. I Thank love you. what you're doing. I think it's really important. It's, it's contemporary, it's also, but it's also preserving history. Um, I think going back to the young people, like the researchers that didn't know how to recognize handwritten letters, like these people, these are like stories they don't know. And I think it, this, is, this is part of, um, it's living history and it's, and it's keeping, it, you know, it's, it's oral tradition. You know, it's helping with the oral tradition of it all, the we, documenting of these oral. You're absolutely, yeah. we need to preserve our stories. When I work with young actors, young queer actors, uh, they're astonished at what went before. They don't know yeah. through no fault of their own. They've popped out in the 21st century. They don't know what life is like. They think, yeah. oh, we could always get married. They right. think that, you know, it, it, you know, we, we could just live our lives. Now, of course, we're blessed to live in California because things are harder for queer people in other states. And that's compounded by gender expression, race, all, color, everything. But we're pretty lucky in LA. But kids don't know that it isn't, we didn't always have the freedoms we enjoy today. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I think it's so important to preserve these stories. Yes, yes. thank you for that. Thank You're you. I, I, before we go, I wanna make sure I want to say this one more time. Um, we also have with us, I see Derek Agile Jones. Um, join the room as well. Derek Agile Jones uh, is one of the actors that you will see next weekend uh, when you watch the live stage production of Dear One. So we're very excited to see the wonderful work of Derek Agile Jones in this production as well. So I want to remind everyone, Dear One will premiere next Friday, November 5th. It will play November 5th. It will play November 6th at a venue in New York City as a live stage production and streamed to a virtual audience. So you do not have to be in New York City. All you have to do is go to fourthuartivist.com to buy your tickets, which as Josh said, is donation based with proceeds going uh, to the Audre Lorde project. Um, mm -hmm. Tickets are $5 to $500. So it's a give what you're able to give. Uh, we just want your support and we want your um, just we want you to enjoy Dear One. So I will put all of that in the post. So you'll have the website. I will put the link in my own bio. So when you just mm -hmm. go to my Instagram page, you just click on the link in my bio. It is going to take you to the page at fourthuartivist.com where you can buy tickets. So um, I am certainly looking forward. I've got a, a couple of friends coming over next Saturday. We're going to watch it together. I love that. I'm excited that. about that. So thank I want it, Joshua, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming thank on you. today and spending this time. Oh my God, and what a joy. Thank you. You are welcome. Thank you. So we'll look forward to seeing you soon. And uh, we'll look forward to Dear One next weekend. And thank you guys for tuning in to Frederick Johnson and Conversation. I will see you again soon for another wonderful interview. Thank you guys. Much love to everybody. Take care and have a wonderful, happy Halloween. Have a wonderful rest of the day. <laughs> Thank you, Frederick. Thanks, everybody. Cool. Blessings.